Hi guys, I'm Jude Mancilla. I am the founder of HeadFi.org, and I've been working with Jacob Sondergaard from Gross and Dan Foley from Audio Precision as we build a measurement lab at the HeadFi office. Um, they came by and they showed me the next generation headphone measurement technology prototype. I was really, really excited by it. The program says I'm the moderator, but this is more of a seminar than anything else um, because I have absolutely nothing. I'm, I'm actually going to get in the audience so I can ask questions at the end. Uh, but uh, it's really exciting, and I just want to introduce Jacob Sondergaard from Gross, and he's going to tell you about some really cool next-generation headphone measurement stuff. All right, Jacob. Thank you, Thank you Jude. Um, so, as Jude mentioned, my name is Jacob Sondergaard. I work for Gross Sound and Vibration. Uh, I hope you guys are familiar with Gross. At this point, it doesn't matter too much, because by the end of the seminar, you will be familiar with what it is that we do. Um, the thing about me and Gross is that I come from Denmark. The company I work for is Danish. And if you've ever been to Denmark um, or Scandinavia in general, it's kind of a, there's a weird thing about society there where quality is so pervasive in, in everything that we do there. Quality over quantity. And when you come to the US, and I've been here for about nine years now in total, it's, you're constantly inundated with the whole, well, quantity, more is better, except in this setting. And I really enjoy this thing about RMAF and especially CanJam, that when it comes to audio and the society and this grouping that we're in here today, it's actually about boiling things down to their essence and to their pure quality. And it's funny that even though I come from a measurement background and the company that I work for comes from a measurement background, I think there's a great overlap and synergy in the way that we view audio and acoustics, and it's about pure quality. So um, what I am going to be talking about today is measurement acoustics. I'll give you a brief overview of the type of innovation and engineering that has happened over the past 60 years to get us to today, what people use today um, to measure, test, and help develop headphones. And I'll present some of the challenges that the test equipment uh, present to the users because it's not perfect. It's a great tool, but it's not perfect. And so through dialogue with a lot of the people, some here in the audience, certainly some out on the uh, KNGM exhibit floor, um, I'll present some of those challenges. And then, of course, our stab at or our approach to the next generation headphone, uh, headphone measurement technology in partnership with Dan Foley over at AP. So the goal, not of the presentation, but of the technology that we're talking about is to, very strictly speaking, boil it down, say it's about making lives easier for the headphone manufacturers. Uh, Designing headphones is incredibly difficult. If you go out onto the floor, talk to some of those guys out there, especially those smaller to medium-sized companies. The guy out there standing in the booth, he's also the lead designer. He's also the janitor and the bookkeeper. He, he does everything. And being able to have tools available to them to speed up their process, to help them navigate uh, the design process just makes their lives a lot easier. And I'm not saying that what we're trying to do is to replace the golden ear. In no way am I saying that, because there are things that we can hear that at present, we just can't, you can't show and document on a graph how it really truly sounds. But what I am saying, and the best analogy that I have for what we do is, if a golden ear has a, a idea and a concept of where they want to go with a pair of headphones, they want to go from A to B, they know that they need to get to point B, but what we deliver to them is a map and a compass that allows them to navigate and track their progress, make the line from A to B a lot quicker and a lot shorter, while allowing them to go through iterations through their development cycle without doing too much repeated work. And it gives them a tool to bring in engineers or technicians that don't necessarily have a golden ear or are trained listeners, but allows them to work on projects that frees up these golden ears to do other things, which for the small and medium-sized companies is hugely important because they do so many other things in, that, uh, in their companies. And so the second thing is that for us as enthusiasts, as consumers of audio, 
the whole idea is that this is then supposed to give us consistently better products that we can enjoy on a daily basis, regardless of whether it's for our profession as, as audio engineers, studio engineers, or whether it's just because we really enjoy listening to music. So I want to take you into my world, navigate through some of that. And the first thing I want to say is that when we start talking about the measurement uh, technology, the first thing is some terminology basics. I don't want to bore you with it, but basically when I say couplers, that's really sort of the key word for the piece of equipment that we use to transfer between the acoustic world, the audio world, and the electrical domain. These electrical signals we can kick into a high quality analyzer and we can start to analyze, manipulate, graph, and share with others in an easy way. Couplers are used for both transmit and receive testing, whether you're testing something that generates noise, like headphones, or something that's meant to receive it, like inline mics, boom mics, PA systems, and so on. Obviously, we're talking today about specifically the small transducers and speakers that go into headphones. Now, the thing about measurement technology is that even though we're here today to talk about the audio side of things, it's been driven for the past 60 years by these other two industries. In particular, audiology has been at the forefront of measurement acoustics. Uh, if you look back at some of the old photos, you see the first type of hearing aids were essentially just giant horns that people used to amplify the sounds getting into the ears. And then sort of up through the 30s and 40s, they started figuring out that you can minimize some of these transducers, place them around the ear, and amplify some sound that you pump into an ear. And they, they started working on these types of transducers, and they quickly figured out that pumping sound into a tiny cavity that is the ear canal and the eardrum and so on isn't the same as just pumping sound into a free field. Um, and so they needed a dedicated test equipment to test these types of things. Likewise, from the telecommunications side, I'm not talking about uh, your small handheld computers. I'm talking about the old first generation telephones with the rotary dials and so on. Um, before they started doing objective testing of those uh, telephone systems, they literally had people in rooms reading the old Reader's Digest magazines through the telephones, and then readers in other rooms listening, and then rating it purely subjectively how they felt the information was transmitted to it. And they gave them a mean opinion score from one to five, and if it was more than about two or three, the system was okay to go into production and could be sold to consumers. Uh, by the way, a mean opinion score of about two or three isn't particularly good. It's basically the minimum for intelligibility. But those were the requirements um, when the first systems came out. Now, th the thing about audio, and in particular the head-worn audio devices, is it's starting to take over. It's combining elements from both of these industries and now it is the driving force in, in the uh, measurement acoustic world. This is the industry, the can jam audience out there. This is the industry that's pushing us and working with us to do something more and something better. So this is the driving force now that has taken over. And it makes sense because when you think about what audio products are doing today, obviously everyone's interested in the full audible band with 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Not that all of us can hear it to 20K, but that's what you would like to reproduce to really represent the sound that was captured on stage or, or wherever it was recorded in a studio. You also want a full dynamic range, something that the other, other industries haven't really been concerned with because once we moved beyond the old Morse code and telegraph system, the electrical lines that were carrying the voice signals were limited to 3,400 hertz. Right? A couple hundred hertz to 3400, that just happens to capture the majority of the speech energy. But that was basically it, and you didn't have a ton of dynamic range to transmit signals. Likewise, the hearing aid world. The number one priority for the hearing aid companies used to be amplifying speech signals so that people suffering from hearing loss could communicate in everyday lives and sort of, you know, get, get on with it without being a total outcast and isolated from the surrounding world. So it was a very limited uh, bandwidth that they were interested in. Now they're obviously pushing beyond that. You have devices like this that try to incorporate full music reproduction, full audio bandwidth. Audiology, uh, the audiology uh, industries are trying to push their hearing aids out to 12K, 16K to bring more 
of the soundscape to the hearing aid wearers just beyond speech so they can start to enjoy those aspects as well. But those industries are relative, relatively conservative relative to the audio world. You guys are the trailblazers here that are pushing this ahead. So just to be clear, we're not talking about your traditional speakers, two speakers in a listening room. We're, we're talking about the head-worn devices, from the in-ear types to the what we call supraoral, the devices that rest on the ear, to the circumoral that completely encompass the ear and sit around the head. So again, some of the nomenclature that we have, if you come up to me and say, coupler, well, we're tuned into the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. If you come up and say ear simulator, we're talking about the same thing. There's some semantic, uh, semantics involved there that make them a little bit different, but that's really the two terms that we use. And then if you start getting into the actual couplers, some of them, all of them, are basically have nicknames that are based on the standards that were created. So you come up and you say to me, I have a 318 coupler. I'd like to use the 711. We're on the same wavelength. But basically, it all refers to the standards that were written to document these ear simulators. So the human auditory system, crudely, it's comprised of two key elements when we're designing our products. Number one, on the outside of the ear, uh, really has to do with diffraction. So everything, you see I've um, bisected the image here. Everything on the left side here has to do with diffraction. It's about physics. It's about geometry. It's about the shape of things. Once you go past this line, what we call the ear entry point, it's about the impedance of this tiny, tiny volume. So for now, let's start by talking about the impedance. If you were to take a small transducer, 40, 50 mil transducer, and just place it in an anechoic chamber or just in a relatively free field, you're basically exposing it to standard acoustic impedance, 410 ohms of air. And that means you're loading your device with an equal and even impedance across the whole frequency range. And assuming it's linear, it'll produce a linear output. Now, if you take this tiny, tiny transducer and you put it into a closed cavity, all of a sudden you see the impedance be vastly different at the lower frequencies. You start to enter almost a pistonic motion. You're trying to push air into a cavity that's closed, that's pushing against that, that driver. So the impedance is vastly different. And as a result, you end up with a vastly different output curve. Again, this is assuming a linear, linear driver. And your output, the sound pressure output, is going to be vastly different. So this is, this is common knowledge dating back over 60 years that the transducers would change their performance. And so when we go back and talk about some of these first couplers, the NBS, National Bureau of Standards, is now NIST. It's the same organization, just a name change. Um, they came out in 1951 with sort of the first standardized coupler for testing audiometric headphones. So if you've ever had an audiogram done, the old TDH39 headphones that they put on you, and then you have to sit and uh, record when you can hear the beeps. Um, those were first tested on these NBS 9A or 6CC couplers. Likewise, it was adopted in the telecommunication standards for testing the old handsets. Now, the funny thing about the what's either known as NBS 9A or 6CC coupler, is that if you look at this drawing, I'm not sure it's clear for everybody, but it's basically a one inch cylinder, a one inch cavity, that adds up to be about 5.6 cubic centimeters, 5.6 cc. It's known as 6cc because if you look at the telephone receiver, there's a slight concave shape to the receiver that when you place it over top here, you end up with a total of 6cc. So it's really only designed for this standard receiver that was in operation back in the 50s. And it's just forever known as a 6cc coupler, even though it's actually only 5.6cc. But that was sort of the first attempt at let's get beyond just a subjective way of evaluating our systems and get into some objective measures that we can take data, we can compare from different manufacturers, different setups, different systems globally as well as locally. Um, 
Now, the thing about this coupler is that it's not good beyond about three or four kilohertz because your primary, you have crazy resonances occurring due to the dimensions and the aspect ratio of that, that 6cc volume. But again, think back to what the, the criteria for the, the analog bandwidth of the telephone lines. They weren't capable of transmitting anything over 3400 hertz. So for, at that time, it was a perfectly suitable coupler for testing those types of products. In the late 50s, each of these European governments sort of independently of each other and almost at the same time came out with the first attempts at ear simulators. Um, and this is where our, our, our syntax and terminology starts to differ a little bit because up until now, I've just been talking about couplers. Couplers really just an acoustic load, a resistance that you put on your transducer. Ear simulators change that in the sense that they're still presenting an acoustic load to your device, but now it actually starts to mimic the acoustic load of the human ear. And so we start to classify them as ear simulators, not just couplers. And so they each came out with different attempts. I think this is the French CNET version. And if you look closely, they use a, a variety of different materials, leather, tin, wool, cotton, some metals. They had a long tube here that's, that ended in a, uh, in a, in a big microphone because at the time, there was no such thing as a measurement grade, a stable, small measurement grade microphone. Um, the problem with all of these attempts is those products, those types of materials are really hard to model and reproduce acoustically. So there was no way of really tracking and comparing between coupler to coupler, because the, pro the materials would drift over time, sensitivity, temperature, humidity, and so on. In the meantime, the hearing aid industries they looked at standardizing a 2cc coupler. So now you go from a 6cc to a 2cc. The difference here is for super oral devices that sit on top of your ear, including the little concave bit of the actual device, you end up with a total volume of about 6c. It's pretty close. For BTEs, behind the ear hearing aids, you now have a receiver that pumps sound through a tiny tube and into the ear canal. And now all of a sudden, you only need the volume of the ear canal to be represented, which is closer to 2cc. So two different applications and two different couplers standardized for those types of measurements. And so based on the work of these European governments in the 50s and some of the standards committees to test very specific products, very specific applications, some clever engineers started working on the next generation of standardized ear simulator. So the name Gunnar Rasmussen may be familiar to you, but he's been He's been very active in the industry uh, dating back to 1952. His nickname is Mr. Microphone. Uh, if you end up going to New York, make sure you go by MoMA, by Central Park, the Museum of Modern Art. You can find his one-inch microphone in there on display, uh, dating back to the late 50s, early 60s. Um, in any case, he experimented a lot with different types of cavities, looking at the frequency responses, and took some cues from these European governments about using multiple volumes to create a complex impedance that tracks what our inner ear impedance is. And so it's sort of widely known that if you, the front volume here right around the concha bow is about two and a half cubic centimeters, but then there's some volume inside your ear, the added ear canal length, that causes extra resonances. And so these volumes here around the side then cause a different response. And this was the first standardized ear simulator dating back to 1962. But if you look at the shape, it's not really conducive to in-ear products. So we're, again, we're just talking about super and circumoral products that can be tested with this type of device. Um, in the 70s, Swiss Lockheed, JJ Swiss Lockheed came up with his uh, ear simulator. It was the first one to be truly standardized to go beyond eight kilohertz. The first 318 coupler or ear simulator was only standardized to eight kilohertz which is leaps and bounds better than three or four kilohertz, and getting further out into the bandwidth to encompass more than just speech energy. The thing about this was Lockheed coupler is that you have your main canal resonance, and then you have four volumes, each adjusted with thumb screws. So to colloquially, it's known as the Frankenstein coupler, because if you imagine, you know, you have a volume and then just screws going right through the head. Um, you adjust those volumes individually and tune it individually. Um, 
It became standardized and even to this day is a recognized occluded ear simulator according to the ANSI standards. You can still use this today. The problem is nobody makes it. Nobody wants to touch it or calibrate it because it's so exceedingly difficult to manufacture, reproduce, and calibrate. And once you install it in a mannequin, for instance, and start to do measurements, if you accidentally bump one of these screws, you totally change the response because your volumes are adjusted. These need to be tuned down to micron-specific lengths to get the right impedance. So they're a bit of a chore to work with, but they did the job. And so in the 80s, Gunner again went to work on improving on Swiss Lockheed's design. And he boiled it down to a very simple construction that's incredibly stable, where all the volumes are on the inside. So when you look at it, it's really just a metal cylinder, but all the volumes are contained inside so that you don't accidentally bump or change anything. And the funny story about this is when, when Gunnar worked for a previous uh, Danish microphone manufacturer, uh, he asked his group of engineers to come and volunteer to have tiny microphones placed at the eardrum so that he can do impedance measurements on them. And when the time came, nobody showed up, nobody volunteered. So he did the measurements on himself and his partner, Pierre Brule. And they took those data points and basically modeled the, what we know as the modern ear simulator based on two data points, him and Pierre Brule. And that's what we know as the modern ear simulator. Now, the great thing is it pretty much lines up with what Swiss Lockheed did. And everybody ever since, in, 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 in particular in the uh, hearing aid industry, they do a lot of measurements at the eardrum location. Every piece of documentation has shown that the transfer impedance actually line up really well up to 10 kilohertz. Because what happens above 10 kilohertz is that our ear canals get all twisted and gnarly and folds and creases and there are hairs and there's earwax and all kinds of things in there that mean the responses are incredibly varied. So much so that when we make our ear simulator, we have a tolerance up to 10 kilohertz that's less than plus minus 1 dB. We just have to be dead on with every single ear simulator that we make. Except when we get to here, and our tolerance goes to plus minus 30 dB. Essentially, we have no tolerance. We can do whatever we want. Because when you look at the, the uh, impedance measurements on human beings, it's the same thing. Everyone's different. Everyone's all over the map, and there's no real consensus on where it is. So for us in the acoustic business, IEC finally made it a little bit easier to grasp. And so if you come up to me and just say IEC 6318-something, we all know that we're talking about electroacoustic products. So it's all the couplers and ear simulators that are all encompassed under one group of standards. The thing that I didn't mention yet is the mannequin standard, which also includes the outer ear. So going back to our little diagram here, having discussed the impedance aspect of reproducing the human auditory system, we have to talk about the outer ear as well, about the diffraction effects that occur out there, because um, except for in-ear monitors and deep insertion earplugs, Headphones, whether they're super or circumoral, they still have to deal with this aspect of a human pinna being uh, an influence on the measurements. So if you take a, a, a nice flat loudspeaker and you put it in an anechoic chamber, doesn't matter which one, um, and you measure it with a microphone. There are no reflections, it's just straight output from that loudspeaker. Assume it's flat, it's a nice flat speaker. Now stick a human being in there, put a microphone at their, ear can, um, at their eardrum, this is the response that you measure at the eardrum. I'm not talking about how we perceive the loudspeaker. This is just the pressure that's recorded at the eardrum. So simply due to the diffraction effects, the reflections coming off the chest and the shoulders, the directionality that our pinna and our contra adds, the resonance of our ear canal, all those parts create this giant bump especially centered right at 2.7K. That's a very, very traditional bump, right at 2.7K. Uh, that basically correlates, that's the strongest correlation there is the ear canal uh, resonance. So the next graph will kind of dive into that because if you take, so this is our response, the black curve, centered peak right at 2.7K. If we were to split our human body into individual components, you'll see how they each play a part in amplifying or um, decreasing the amplitude of the eardrum. 
So if you just had a spherical head, you'd see a slowly increasing pressure as you, as you go up in frequency. The torso and the neck, so you're really below two kilohertz, and, and there's not a tremendous effect on the sound pressure at the eardrum. Now, once you start getting closer and closer and closer to the eardrum, you see the pinna flange here, right at 3, 4K. The green curve plays a big role, number four. Number three is the concha bowl, which is this area right in front of your ear canal, has a huge effect on amplifying frequencies, in particular right around 6K. And then, as I mentioned, the actual ear canal resonance right there at 2, 3 kilohertz has the largest effect on the overall um, what we call head-related transfer function. So the transfer between a microphone in a free field and a human being in a free field. Now, if you think about how sound impacts your ear, it doesn't matter which way the sound is coming from. It always has to go through the ear canal. You can't avoid going through the ear canal. You can sort of avoid going through most of the pinna if you sort of hit right at maybe 85 degrees and get a straight shot at the eardrum. You still need to go through the ear canal. So there's always going to be a very dominant amplification right at 2.7K. Talking about that ear canal, though, in the 70s, when the mannequins were standardized, when the Swiss locky couplers were standardized, when this pinna was standardized, did it really matter what the actual ear canal shape was when your products looked like this? Cylindrical yellow foam plugs, great fit right in a cylindrical ear canal. Sacks, headphones, speakers on your heads, probably doesn't make too big of a difference telephones or behind the ear, hearing aids? Probably not. And so the equipment that's been around since essentially 1972 with the Swiss Lockheed coupler, later the 7-Eleven, and the, and the Keymar mannequin has been using this technology. And it's been adopted by the consumer audio industry, and it's been used by the consumer audio industry to, to great success. And that really takes us to where we are today, to something like this mannequin, here, with an ear that looks, you know what an ear looks like, that, and then the ear simulator on the inside. And that's really what we're talking about to represent the human auditory system. Now, the proof is in the pudding. Look how close this is. It's almost identical. <laughs> so it's actually, it's, it does a great job of representing the human auditory system for all types of measurements, both for hearing aids, telecommunication devices, as well as consumer audio devices. It gives you the ability to measure these crucial components, log them, track them, use them in your development, feed them to the engineers, correlate between what the golden ears are saying and what you're able to measure, or vice versa. Maybe you can measure, if, if you saw Jonathan Novick's presentation yesterday, a great presentation, by the way, about spec sheets and different types of measurements, certain distortion products, you can track these and measure these. You can correlate them to how your golden ears feel that they impact the audio response or the sonic signature of the headphones, for instance. So as I mentioned, in particular, for this industry here in CanGem, there's a lot of small to medium-sized companies. And these guys are working really hard to get their companies up and running. Now, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that they need to focus on. One of them is obviously to distinguish themselves on the experience that they provide to their users, to us, to, to the consumers of their devices. And so the products that, that, that are available on the market um, can help them do that. But there's been a huge change, especially in the last 10 years, in terms of just product ID, the industrial design of products. Um, we're moving into, uh, earbuds are becoming a lot more popular. They're getting more anatomically correct shaped. We have in-ear monitors. We have different types of uh, Bluetooth communication devices that sit in the ear. We have hearing aids that go all the way into the ear canal where we're starting to see that the, the shape of the ear and the shape of the ear canal uh, now starts to matter a lot more just in terms of placement and fit and seal. Um, and that is a challenge with the current setup and the current standard. So the other thing and sort of tangential to that is 
if you're trying to measure the low frequency response of a pair of headphones, if you're not getting a good seal, you're getting a reduction in your low frequency response. And so that's not the intended uh, case when it comes to actually using it as a human being. When you put on a pair of headphones, you'll usually adjust them to your liking and make sure you get a nice, nice good fit. And they'll usually seal very well. But some of the limitations in the pinna that are on the market means that despite having a very realistic uh, hardness, a shore durometer, they don't flex like they normally would. And so for slimmer design headphones, for instance, it can be a challenge where the headphone cups are lifted off the head of the mannequin that make it hard to get a good seal. And the sort of the other aspect of that is the EPA in the US has a little blurb about noise um, reduction rating for hearing protection devices. And so I'm going to read it. It's bad form, but I'm going to read the slide out to you. It says, products that are designed and sold on the basis of their ability to reduce the level of sound they may enter the ears, thou shall determine the performance and properly label them with their effectiveness rating, so the noise reduction rating, for legal entry into US commerce. Now, this is for hearing protection devices. But when you think about some of the products, more on the consumer side that are coming out with active noise canceling, passive noise canceling, they're advertising their products primarily on the ability to reduce sound. And they're sort of teetering on the edge here of having to legally specify this. Now, so far, that's not been the case. But knowing US lawyers, somebody's going to figure out how to make a lot of money by suing consumer audio devices based on these statements that are really intended for hearing protection device uh, manufacturers. But it all goes together. Can you reproduce low frequency? And can you block low frequencies from the outside, for instance? Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, we have very strict tolerances for how to make this curve. But above that, there's really no criteria. And so this is the result of the natural resonance that occurs inside a 7-Eleven coupler or a Swiss Lockheed coupler. That's just due to the length of the ear canal and the resonances that occur. Now, the problem is we're giving a plus minus one kilohertz tolerance up there. So even though we are great at manufacturing these down to within a couple hundred hertz up there, it still gives you, if you have two peaks that are slightly off, a huge variation in what the output response would be. At the same time, just operating on this type of resonance means it's very hard to attribute any uh, qualitative value to the output that you're getting from your devices, because you're not really sure exactly what the amplification is from the system. So in that sense, and going back to the terminology, the 7-Eleven coupler is standardized as an ear simulator below 10 kilohertz, but just as a coupler above. So everybody can agree, this looks right, below 10 kilohertz. Above, at that point, it's just a load. Not realistic, but it's a load. So it's better than nothing. But that's obviously a huge problem trying to operate there. And, and what I say to our customers is that your response there above 10 kilohertz is more of a binary thing in the sense that you either have output from your headphones or you do not have output. Don't, don't spend too much time figuring out if it's smooth or ag at that point, use your golden ears. Okay? It's very, very difficult to attribute anything up there because of the shape of this. And so the other thing is with the transducers that are used in the ear simulators, they have a noise floor somewhere around here. Now, the blue curve is a map of the US minus Florida. Also happens to be the threshold of human hearing. And, and so if you give yourself, which is pretty common, a, a 10 dB signal to noise ratio, when you're doing your measurements, there's this entire area down here where the golden ears, or even just general consumers, can actually hear what's going on, but we can't measure that. So there's a gap in information available to the users, which is something that we've heard through our dialogue with the, uh, with the manufacturers. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but sometimes it can be very difficult to look at charts and graphs and plots and numbers and correlate that to what the golden ears of the trained listeners are saying. Usually, program uh, manufacturers will have specific terminologies that they use that are standardized to them. That they, but if you are looking for terminology, they, Delta put a, uh, it's almost like a, a library of terminology that you can use to help 
um, use um, scales of 1 to 10 for all types of different uh, metrics relating to the sound. So rather than a golden ear talking about mid bass, high bass, saying that there's something muddy or cloudy or deep, and the engineer's thinking, how do I, how do I correct for that? Uh, if, if you don't already have great terminology there, there are ways you can, you can, um, you can help bridge that gap. And hopefully the, the measurement equipment can get a little bit better to make it easier to do so. So basically when we boil it down, it's really about, if we do our job on the first five, we, we, we increase our repeatability, we increase our accuracy, and we reduce the time for these manufacturers out there that they have to spend fiddling around with, with these challenges. They can get their products out to launch, and ultimately we can get better products that we can listen to. So taking all these things, all these dialogues that we've had, and combining them with some of the things that we do like, because there are a lot of aspects to the current equipment that is fantastic, that we can use, that everybody can agree on, is a great representation of what the uh, headphones are exposed to. And we come out with uh, our approach here. So to address the first one about the fit and the placement and the seal, we've come out with a new ear. Now, it doesn't look any different to the outside because the actual shape of the pinna is pretty much the same. But what we've done is we've integrated the ear canal and we made it anatomically correct. So it's based on hundreds of 3D scans. So rather than this cylindrical thing, you now have the first bend of the normal double bend of a human ear canal. We can't do the full double bend, so, any, so basically very, very deep insertion products are still going to be limited here. But this is a vast improvement. And the other thing is removing a little bit of the material, not really changing the gerometer, but removing some material back here allows the pinna to flex just a little bit better. So when you look at the mannequin from the back, you see the left side under the load of super oral headphones flexes a lot better as opposed to the right ear, which is the traditional pinna. The shape is essentially the same, but just these modifications improve that flex and that seal. What that means is if you're taking a pair of in-ear devices and you measure 100 times, your standard deviation is going to go from one standard deviation, one sigma, about 6 to 9 dB, to down below 2 in the low end. Just from changing to something that's more anthropomorphic, something that's more human-like. Should we do questions now? Hi. Uh, let's see. Do you think that around the ear headphones fit better than on ear headphones with respect to what you were just talking about? On the test equipment? I think we should sample the audience rather than me talking for everybody here. I think, uh, personally, I think the circumoral, the ones that really encompass the ear, open back, are, are generally better. But again, I don't have ears that protrude particularly far and, so, and, and they collapse towards the head like most ears do. You can feel your own ears if you want. Um, and and so I feel like on, on me, they are generally very, very a good fit and for the nice headphones produce a nice sound, but it's a limitation with the current equipment, test equipment, that makes it very difficult to reproduce those tests. So, so when you listen to the headphones, you know that they sound good, you know that there's a bass response there, but when you put it on the equipment, the ear would kind of just lift it ever so slightly and create leaks. And so if you create leaks, you lose your low frequency, your bass response. So it's just a function of how big that leak is um, relative to the, to the loss of bass response. But that's one of the things that we're trying to address here. 
and, and in talking with the uh, exhibitors out here and other partners worldwide, uh, how to address this issue. So this is the, does that answer your question? So this, the, the second set of graphs here um, shows the response for a set of in-ears. So the scale, if it's not clear, it's um, 5 dB here. So you see the response here is all over the map for the traditional style just because it's so difficult to fit them. And this is what the manufacturers deal with. It's exceedingly difficult to do measurements. It is a valuable tool, but it's difficult. It's, it's very much an art form. And this improves that tremendously. Same thing for the super orals. So I think these are Sennheiser Momentums. Very nice headphones. Um, but you see how the whole thing just tightens up when you use the new. This is just purely a result of the ear being ever so slightly more flexible and being able to conform a little bit better to the cushion of the headphone. Now, if you're able to get a good low frequency response, you're able to measure the, for instance, active noise cancellation properties of your headphones or earphones much, much better. So this is just a graph showing the relative effect of passive attenuation and active plus passive attenuation. So passive really doesn't do anything above a kilohertz, whereas the active really kicks in at the low end. These particular in-ears are tuned for 150 hertz, which happens to be very, very close to the drone of a jet engine when you're flying. So these are very comfortable to wear when you fly, for instance. To address the high frequency aspect, which is so difficult to work with, the new ear simulator that we are coming out with and proposing has a totally different high frequency response. There's two aspects that I, wanna, uh, that I would like to highlight. Number one is that we split the resonance. So rather than having this one nasty curve, you now have two smoother, softer curves. Again, there's no agreement on whether this is realistic or not, but it's something that's going to help the manufacturers for two ways. Number one is if you look at the high frequency response, you're able to get just a smoother response. You're not hovering on this giant high Q resonance anymore. And so the response is going to be a lot smoother with the new one as opposed to the old one, which gets pretty cloudy right here. You see the variability in the response. Number two is if you looked at the curve, actually above 13K, the output of the ear simulator is going to be much, much higher. And so the output of your measurements is going to be higher. It's going to give you an ability to really look at the data that you're getting. Not only is it smoother and more consistent and more repeatable, it's also a higher amplitude. Now, obviously, the headphones are going to roll off at the higher ends, and this is going to combat that by giving you at least a good 10, 10 to 15 dB more headroom to work with at those higher frequencies. To address the issue of measuring down to the threshold of human hearing, this is the noise floor of the new ear simulator that we're proposing. So really all but this little intersection here, three to four kilohertz, we're able to measure well below what you can actually hear. And so if you have, um, uh, go back to electronics, if you have some electronics in there, if it's not just a pair of passive headphones, the electronics can, under certain circumstances, uh, go into low power states and exhibit microphonics. There could be squeaking going on and singing and ringing of components. Um, there could be hissing of components that you can definitely hear when you're wearing them, but you can't measure using the traditional equipment. So if you, for a second, just ignore everything below 100 hertz, we were doing these measurements and in our chamber, and right above us, there was some construction going on. So we were getting a lot of noise down at the low end. But everything above 100 hertz, the blue curve at the very bottom is just our background noise. It's very, very quiet. We're down below zero in individual frequency bands. Put our active noise canceling headphones on there. Don't switch them on. Just put them on there. It really doesn't change the actual sound pressure down at those levels. Now switch on the circuitry. Switch it to low, high, doesn't really matter where you are. All of a sudden, 
this circuitry is buzzing along. It's trying to compensate for things that aren't there, creating some feed forward and feedback issues. It's hissing. And you can hear that when you put them on. But you couldn't measure that. If you remember the, the, um, the noise floor, the absolute noise floor of the, of the existing 7-11 coupler sort of right in here between 10 and, 10 and 20 dB in individual frequency. You can't even see that. It's drowned out in the noise floor of the system. Now, to address the fifth challenge about how does it correlate to the subjective measurements, uh, we rely on you. Because it's not really our role to say whether, whether the response matches up to your golden ears, but we rely on the feedback from our partners in the industries to, to tell us that we're going in the right direction. And everything that we've heard so far through our partners, through the demos that we've done, the prototyping rounds that we've done, is that this is a huge leap forward that addresses a lot of the issues that they've been struggling with with the existing equipment. So we're working on addressing all these issues that they've presented to us, taking root in everything that we've learned over the past 60, 70 years, and making those changes and modifications to uh, address the development that the consumer audio industry has gone through, especially in the last 10 years. It's been tremendous. With, um, uh, in particular, the CanJam audience, the headphone industry, earbuds, and so on. They're really taking off. Um, and when you really boil it down, you know, we hope that this makes life so much easier for the manufacturers out there because the joy of being able to listen to great products to have these products come out more frequently, have them be infinitely better than they were before, and at a price point that basically there's something for everybody is, is a fantastic time to be a part of. There was another panelist on Friday that said that CanJam is a, is a gateway drug. And I don't know if you remember the, the, um, the panel. I think it's a very valid point that especially for uh, kids and young adults that don't necessarily have the funds nor the authority to redecorate their parents' living room with high-end speakers, they get an opportunity to get a great sounding pair of headphones for uh, anywhere from 100 bucks and up that vastly improves the, the, the music that they already have. And just that little step gets them closer to enjoying music and becoming true audiophiles and really living this issue about audio quality. And so for us to play a tiny role in that, uh, infinitely small role in that, is, is very gratifying. But it's a cooperative effect that we have to work with you guys to, to, to know where we're going. Because we, we're, not the, uh, we're not the drivers of where you guys are going. You are. Dan, do you want to say a few things? So thank, thank you uh, very much here, Jacob. So what I want to do is just spend a few moments here to talk about on the measurement side. And uh, we're, yeah, uh, where's my mouse? Here we go. So you saw with this new coupler that, uh, along with the electronics that Grass has introduced, there is now the ability of an acoustical front end to basically measure acoustical phenomenon all the way down to the threshold of human hearing. And on the electronic side of things, life can certainly be interesting. Uh, so I want to just talk a few moments about why a low noise front end is required, not just a nice to have, but really required now in this new world that uh, the grass technology is opening up. But before, just, just a quick overview of who we are, pretty sure that everyone here in the room knows the name of Audio Precision. But just to give a quick background for those of you that might not be familiar with the company, we're now 31 years old, and uh, it's a spinoff from Tektronix. So the four, the, these four gentlemen started the company. They actually were the primary engineering team that developed the first audio analyzers from Tektronix back in the 70s and then they created audio precision in the early 80s. 
And one of the things that I really love about working for AP is that we're involved in all facets of the entire audio signal chain, working for the chip companies, transducer companies, et cetera. So that gives us kind of unique perspective of what's happening in audio. And you know, a, a, a tremendous amount of effort is going in on the audio IC side of things to get lower and lower noise of their devices, transducer manufacturers, especially headphone transducers, because there's a huge growing market, a lot of research going on into developing more exotic transducers with various materials that will be able to have wider bandwidths, better transient response, et cetera. So all of this is meaning now that the equipment, the measurement equipment itself needs to be operating at a higher uh, performance level. So, um, Let's look at some basic math in here as to what's going on with any acoustical system, whether you're talking about speaker measurements, measurements with couplers, what have you. It starts with this device called a microphone. So a microphone is going to take the air pressure that is impinges on the diaphragm, converts that to a voltage. And all microphone spec sheets provide a sensitivity relative to one pascal. And in the sound pressure level world of decibels, sound pressure of one pascal is 94 dB. So when you see a spec sheet on a microphone that says this microphone, for example, is 50 millivolts per pascal, well then what that means is when there is a 94 dB SPL sound field that the microphone is exposed to, the voltage that's going coming out of that microphone is going to be 50 millivolts. Now when we look at uh, the threshold of hearing, and actually you saw what the curve that uh, Jacob said looks like, the United States minus Florida due to climate change, that little part of uh, Texas in here that's actually dipping below zero dB SPL. Well, zero dB SPL is a physical sound pressure level of 20 millionths of a pascal, and actually I should not say this was a 20 million times lower, it's actually 21 20 millionths of this value. So what that means is if you want to measure any acoustical phenomenon that is at this physical sound pressure level, the voltage coming out of that microphone will be one twenty millionth of the voltage that's presented on that sensitivity chart. So a typical coupler uh, is about 12 and a half millivolts per pascal. So if you now look at this and say, well, I want to now measure zero dB, you're talking about a voltage level that's 250 nanovolts. So that's pretty darn small, all right? If we now look at the new system that GRASS is introducing, that's 800 millivolts per pascal. So huge amount of gain, which is very, very good, because now these signals, these or these or this acoustical phenomena that actually exists and is audible by humans, previous to the grass technology was literally buried in the noise floor of the equipment, which is also one of the reasons why there have been times in the industry where people would say, well, I can hear it, but I can't measure it. Well, how much of the stuff you're trying to measure, which you could hear, was actually buried in the noise floor of your instrumentation, but it's not buried in the noise floor of your own head. So now we look at the new grass couplers, similar uh, measurement, uh, or a similar measurement of, of uh, zero dB SPL is about 16 microvolts. So again, a huge, huge amount of amplification. So if we just look at um, test equipment in general, I'm just curious, not so much that this is just showing AP equipment, but just in general, how many people here are familiar with this type of presentation of performance of any electronic device, but especially measurement equipment? Is anyone here familiar with saying these? Okay, a few hands have gone up. Uh, well, the AP people don't count. <laughs> so what this is showing is the graph of total harmonic distortion plus noise and THD uh, plus noise or THD only as a measurement is always a ratio. It's a ratio to the, the distortion energy divided by the test level. And this uh, scale in here is showing the output level of a generator at one kilohertz and we're measuring over the entire audio range. So these numbers, these decibel numbers are representing how many dB down from whatever voltage level in here is all this distortion and noise stuff. So you can see these are all, all these 
analyzers, our analyzers, plus various competition. These are all very well-known names in the market. And why I'm bringing this up is not to necessarily single out this particular company, but this is typically the sort of performance you're going to get with sound card, uh, a sound card front end. And there's a lot of sound card based test and measurement systems out there that you look at the price, you go, oh, this is pretty attractive. And likewise, there are low cost microphones. And one of the reasons they might be low cost is they may not and probably do not have the quality of preamplifier electronics and power supply electronics that you know, something along the lines of, of, of a grass company has. So you need to be aware of this because with the, the fact that the ear can be sensitive to such extremely low sound pressure levels, and the only way to measure those sound pressure levels is this thing called a microphone, and a microphone is producing a voltage, that thing that's plugged in, or the microphone plugs into, better be able to measure these low signals. Otherwise, you can just be, you can uh, either have no idea where to go forward with your design, or you make some bad engineering decisions and you're just kind of guessing what's going on or you think you've got a measurement that's truly reflecting what's happening when it isn't. So what I did here this morning is I'm looking at the, the self-noise characteristics relative to one millivolt. This is our APX515 analyzer. And these numbers are really, really small, but these big lines in here are 10 dB increments. So what I did is I put in a one millivolt signal at one kilohertz, and I set that to be zero dBRA, meaning it's just zero dB is relative to whatever voltage you want. So I made zero dB be relative to one millivolt. And why I'm doing that is saying, okay, the typical coupler at one millivolt, coupler being at 12 and a half millivolts per pascal, that's a physical sound pressure level of 72 dB. So the big issue here is saying, okay, now, given what's going on with the spectrum analyzer, or the test equipment, where is its noise characteristics? These little spikes in here related to the power supply. These little spikes in here related to some of the distortion of, of the signal generator itself. But relative to this 72 dB level, when we look at what's happening with the performance of the analyzer, so this would be 62 dB SPL, 52, 42, 32, 22, 12, 2, uh, where are we at now? I, I didn't do too good in math when we got to the negative numbers of the number line. So we're pretty darn low in here. So if we go down to what would be zero dB SPL, so that would be roughly in the minus, you know, 72 dB range, you still see that any of the inherent, let's say, junk noise of the test equipment in this particular, the, the model 515, it's power supply related harmonics and, and distortions related to the generator are still 10 to maybe 15, 20 dB below this extremely low voltage level. Now, what's the difference between the blue curve and the red curve? This is an FFT, and the, the uh, FFT, uh, in the case of the AP world, there can be FFTs of all various resolutions, and likewise, uh, systems, lower cost systems that might be uh, uh, attractive to you because of the price, in particular if the price is zero, one of the things one of the things I recommend is, is, well, two things I want to recommend is, number one, any system you're looking at, be it AP or whatever, you want to do this measurement. You want to have, to have the system be able to do a measurement with FFT analysis to characterize what is going on with the system itself. Secondly, if the system can have a very high resolution FFT, so this FFT here was a 64,000 point FFT, meaning there's 32,000 FFT lines or FFT bins between basically DC and 20 kilohertz. The red curve here is the highest resolution that we offer at AP, which is 1.2 million data points, which means there's 638,000 FFT lines. So what's happened is the self noise in the instrument is now dropped by several dB, in fact, uh, almost an order of magnitude. Any components that are, that are inherent in the instrument itself will still be there, but any broadband noise energy drops down lower. So how can this be used in the acoustic end of things for characterizing headphones or electronics that are gonna be driving the headphones is that having the ability to have very, very high resolution FFTs allow you to literally get uh, sinusoidal components, whatever their source might be, you know, intermodulation uh, occurring in the electronics or the drivers themselves 
you literally can extract extremely low level sinusoidal information, i.e. noise stuff, literally gets extracted from the noise because a high re resolution FFT can make that noise energy drop by a tremendous amount. But it all starts with the inherent noise of the test equipment itself. What's going on with anything regarding to its power supply? What's going on with the inherent distortion of the signal generator? And when you talk about with electronics and, and data acquisition systems where it's inside a computer or you have very, very densely packed electronics, you know, the more stuff that you're trying to put in electronics in a smaller package, more crosstalk you have, more, more general junk in there. And when you do these sorts of uh, self-tests of the instrument, you'll be seeing uh, much more uh, distortion and noise than you would have otherwise. So the big takeaway here is that Probably the biggest takeaway is you want to characterize your measurement system, regardless of whose it is. In particular, if you have the ability to do FFT analysis and the gr larger the FFT sizes that the test system is able to get, the greater the amount of resolution you can have and thus the more detailed information you can extract. So I am done. <laughs> yes? In the, in the slide that you showed me two slides ago with the uh the THD plus noise. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, Bannon, can you use a uh, microphone? Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Are, are, those, uh, are those vertical jumps just gain switching, or is that something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good point here. So these vertical jumps are the auto ranging circuitry. In here. Okay. So that's the other thing when you talk about these lower cost you know, data acquisition systems, anything with a sound card in it, there is not going to be auto ranging circuitry. You know, so what's happening in all of these analyzers, the manufacturers have put in high precision resistor ladder network and, and voltage sensing, you know, comparator circuits that say, oh, the input voltage is now this, I'm now going to jump to the next range. So with auto ranging, if it is appropriately implemented, what that's meaning is that at low signal levels, uh, you can be jumping down to appropriate ranges to maximize the number of, of bits available in the A to D. So what's happening there is when you see those vertical jumps, that's when the voltage was approaching the upper limit of that particular auto-ranging voltage threshold, and then it jumps to the, to the next level. Uh, and uh, just one more question. When so this, this new GRS microphone in combination with your system, they've got this order of magnitude nearly sensitivity increase, or more than order of magnitude. Does the noise floor of the microphone also increase by an order of magnitude, do you know? Or is this just, a, I guess my question is, is this to get around microphone noise floor, or electronics noise floor, or, or both? Which both. one is the contributor? Both, both. So uh, the whole idea is to drop the noise floor. And that's both, both to compensate for the acoustic, the thermal noise of the actual capsule itself and for the electronics. So it's reducing both. Can you pass the microphone right behind you? I'm, I'm curious uh, to your stance and what you guys are doing to uh, understand uh, or develop or project a target response curve for headphones because right now they're isn't a IEC spec or spec anywhere for what the target response is supposed to be. So a lot of what you talked about delivers relative accuracy from one measurement to the next, but doesn't address absolute accuracy. Would you like us to do that? I'd like somebody to do it. Yeah. Or, yeah. I would like somebody to do it as well. I don't think we are the right people to tell everybody how a headphone should sound. I, I don't think we're the right people. And you're right, because when you go out to every single manufacturer, everybody has their own curves. They're all based in one, in one sense or another on the head-related transfer functions with a lot of tweaks and modifications and, 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 and twists to accommodate their style, their brand, their image, and so on. Um, but we, I don't think we are not going to go out and state thou shall make a headphone according to this compensation curve. That's not our role. Um, there's a lot of consultants in the industry that some use our equipment, some don't. Uh, Chris Strzok, uh, if you're familiar with him from CGAS Labs, he's very active. He's done a lot of AES papers on um, modified diffuse field response as an ideal uh, headphone compensation curve or a modification of the free field, sort of an averaging of the free field, especially with a frontal 
bias because a traditional listening room usually incorporates two headphone towers at the front. And so if you take uh, head-related transfer functions that really average, uh, a lot of it's centered from the negative 30 side and plus 30 side, you get a pretty good approximation of the sound. But it's not our role to say whether that's accurate or not. That's really, I mean, I would love it if there was an industry board that would agree to something, um, but I don't think we're that, we would love to cooperate on it. Let me put it that way. You certainly calibrate your, your microphones for measuring speakers for flat. Correct. But then there's the question of how do you create and develop headphone measurement equipment that you know is accurate relative to flat when there is no accepted flat. Correct. And so it's very difficult. And so the thing that we can do is base our equipment in the scientific world and in the physical world and on the physical measurements that have been done on human subjects and say, this is what the physical effects will be on a human. And here you have the comparable objective measurement equipment. Now, if you need to do some tuning and compensation to address the way that you would like your headphones to sound, go ahead but at least we have a system where you can compare apples to apples that has the traceability in the physical world. Um, but I, I would totally endorse a, a standards group from the industry uh, to talk about what would be ideal and how would we go about doing that. And then one quick comment, your ability to fold that ear back is great because I have so much problems. With it, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, really it's cool. It's, it's very difficult, and it, it's, it's minor changes, and we would love, again, for you know, somebody to bring this up and talk. And this is a sneak preview. We're not coming out for another month or so with this, but this is the audience that's really driving us and really pushing us. And so this is our opportunity to kind of give you a heads up that we are working on this, we are listening, and especially that comment is a big deal, yeah. as you just mentioned. It, it, yeah. It's super hard yep. to get them on there. Yep, yep, agreed. There's two. Uh, you, you, have a, you have a mic right there. Um, yeah, you answered one question for me in terms of when this will be available. As somebody about to buy some of this gear, um, so in about a month, do you expect the price points to be, as a percentage, uh, approximately the same? Does this replace the previous gear, or is it an upgrade and it's X amount more, or do you know that yet? We're not, we're not set on that, and I prefer not to talk pricing uh, in this well, setting. It is, I mean, it is a, going to be a very high-end R&D tool to start with until we get some momentum behind this. Uh, but to put it into perspective, making a transducer that measures below the threshold of human hearing is exceedingly difficult to make it accurate and stable over a 20-year lifespan. Mm -hmm. It's not just today and then it's gone tomorrow. This has to be stable for a very long period. Uh, now put that microphone into an ear simulator, into a mannequin, and still, it's exceedingly difficult work. And so, yes, there will be a premium for something like this. And I don't think, I don't think the 7-Eleven coupler will necessarily just be written out of the bylaws. You've seen the Swiss Lockheed standard. Uh, the Swiss Lockheed coupler has been a standard for 40-some years now. Now, I know from Chris Strzok, who runs the working group that, that chairs S3.25, uh, the... So it's lucky couplers written in as a legacy coupler and on the next iteration will be written out. So it will no longer be a valid measurement. Maybe 30 years from now, 7-Eleven coupler will reach the same fate. And I don't know if this will replace it, but this is our approach. And if you are familiar with standards committees, which I'm sure you are, sometimes it can get very political. Sometimes it can get very laborious and time consuming. And in a sense, uh, we didn't really want to sit on our hands knowing that we had all this feedback and all these issues that the industry was dealing with. And so here's an approach. Let's see where this takes us. And if we can agree that this is a, a step in the right direction, great. And then, you know, let's talk about if it can be standardized. But that's a whole different matter. Jude. Will, will the new uh, technologies, both the PINA, the simulator, will they be available for gross only products? If so, which cross products will it be available for other manufacturers? Uh, for the time being, it's intended to be for our products. If it can interface with others, uh, maybe. We haven't really gotten to, we haven't even released it yet. Okay. Let alone thought about 
putting it into different packages. Um, but the intent is always to make it 100% backwards compatible. So if you have grass gear, the intent is that you can install this into existing grass gear. Okay. We have just a few more minutes. Yes. Uh, so if we already own your 7-Eleven coupler and pin eye, what do we need to upgrade to this new high sensitivity version? We need the, the, the pin A and we need the, uh, the new, the new microphone? Simulator. Yeah, the new ear simulator. And we can use our existing calibrator and yeah. the little tray that the ear sits in and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the intent is you, you'd have to, you can't just swap out a little piece in the ear simulator. You would need the new ear simulator, but it would fit inside a mannequin. It would fit in the tabletop displays, that kind of thing. That's the intent with the whole system. So we're not handcuffing you to buying a whole new mannequin, for instance, by doing this. One, one more. I want to thank Audio Precision for having such incredibly good technical support. I have saved dozens and dozens and dozens of hours just by giving you guys a call, so thank you very much. Well, for thank, thank you for saying that, so appreciate that. I think that's it. Cool. Thank you.